So dear participants, many thanks for joining this first edition of FRH Talks. Uh, in today's talk, we, we have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Mr. Gilles Gué, the representative uh, of Robé for uh, cultural heritage, and he will pr be presenting the very interesting case of the Church of St. Joseph. So um, with no further ado, I, I hand it over to Mr. Gilles Gué, um, please. Well, thank you, Jordi, um, thank you all for attending uh, and start. Screen, uh, sharing the screen, first of all. Um, is it all right? Can you see? Okay. Yeah. So um, as Geordie said, I will um, give you a brief talk about the church we are restoring right now in Roubaix, which is called Saint Joseph. Um, but first of all, maybe uh, a few words about Roubaix, the city itself. Um, Roubaix is a city which is situated in northern France at the border with Belgium. Um, in 1814, it was a very small town of only 8,500 inhabitants. In 1911, it was a major industrial city. That's the date at which this town hall was built. Um, a major industrial city of 125,000 people. The town benefited from the textile boom, which implied the construction of lodgings, factories, services, and religious buildings. The Saint Joseph Church, of which we're going to talk, was built in the Alma district, part of Roubaix, with the aim of addressing the Flemish population, numerous in this neighborhood. It was consecrated in 1878. The architect was Jean-Baptiste Bethune from Belgium, a disciple of Pagin and a neo-Gothic follower. He left the project in 1879, but his ideas were retaken by the priest, Father Edouard Lesage, who invited artists and craftsmen. He got the church decorated with mural paintings, carvings, stained glass windows, and managed to get an organ built. In the second half of the 20th century, the church was in danger. It was looked after though, but major investments were needed. Being built in a popular district and in a city which was facing the textile industrial crisis, it was evident that money was going to be a problem. First, a group of heritage activists, Aractions, drew the attention of the authorities on the beauty of the place. The city, which owns the church, solicited a protection and the building was listed in 1983. And this is what characterizes the whole Saint Joseph renovation project from the beginning, the number and diversity of the persons and organizations it implies. It all started with the joint efforts of associations, local authorities, the French state, and the Catholic Church. Then the renovation was launched by stages from 1997 till 2001, drainage and permeability were the main focuses. In 2003, a local association was set up which dedicates itself to the safeguard of the building, to secular activities in the church, like touristic tours and cultural activities, Les Compagnons de l'Église Saint-Joseph de Roubaix. In 2009, a second renovation phase was launched, which lasted till 2011, and which implied the renovation of some of the stained glass windows. Meanwhile, the city benefited from the support of the first donors and of La Sauvegarde de la Française. Besides, donors started to unite themselves in a group locally animated called Le Cercle des Mécènes de l'Église Saint-Joseph. And from 2014 till 2029, 21, sorry, a third phase took place, which implied the restoration of the roof of its timber frame of the outer walls, the remaining stained glass windows, 
the painted walls, the light, the clock, the bell system. And so much remains to be done today. We have to restore the organ, the way of the cross, the copy of the Lourdes de Sanctuary, the presbytery, to quote a few items. As a matter of fact, the organ and the presbytery are our next targets. The St. Joseph's Church is now preserved. Most of the work has been done. The, transi the transition has been easy between the restoration process and the resumption of the activities after the seven years closure. First of all, the religious life immediately resumed, the community being eager to reinvest its church for masses, baptism, weddings, funerals. We mentioned it, a great number of persons and organizations have been involved in the restoration and share a passion for this magnificent building, of course, for different reasons. We named some of them before, the church, local associations, donors, la sauvegarde de la Française, local authorities, the French state, believers, visitors. And all of them, one way or another, now play a part in the church reopening. Um, Saint Joseph now hosts many, uh, just make a mistake on the photograph, just get back. Saint Joseph now hosts many activities, the religious ones, which we mentioned, are first and foremost. Saint Joseph is also a wonderful setting for concerts with an excellent acoustic having a wooden nave. Its capacity for security reasons is limited to 300 persons, but we're trying to change it to 400 persons so that the income be more important in case of paying concerts. Saint Joseph is not the only building, of course, of major importance in Roubaix. Um, in Roubaix, we want to welcome more public, and we already have many visitors uh, who come to La Piscine. You can see a photograph of the museum, one of the most important French museums. It is a, a municipal museum. Uh, we are becoming a touristic place with nearby La Villa Cavrois, a beautiful modernist house designed by Robert Mallet Stephen. The local association, the Compagnons de l'Église Saint-Joseph de Roubaix, is trying to get teams of volunteers so as to open more often. For the time being, it's to open only on Saturday mornings, on Sunday mornings, and by appointment any day of the week. And the Compagnons de l'Église Saint-Joseph has just joined the Open Churches program that you all know, so as to get involved in a network and get more visibility for the church. Last, having so many persons interested in the building and its project, it is relatively, relatively easy to draw the attention of the press and of the public on so much beauty. Saint Joseph is now regularly covered by the press, local and national, and the more coverage we have, the more public we welcome. We made it, starting with an unknown church. We managed to get it restored. We managed to reopen it. We succeeded in offering visitors and believers a thing of beauty, a fantastic place, a masterpiece of the neo-Gothic style. It is all about beauty and people. And that is the most interesting part of heritage. It offers exceptional sights to the public and brings people together. That was the initial aim of the church in the Alma district dressing the neighborhood, teaching them using paintings and stained glasses, using beauty with a meaning. Times have changed. The church, which is a wonderfully coherent example of the neo-Gothic style, was preserved. And thanks to all those who look after it and worked in its restoration, it is now addressing a much larger public, religious and secular, French, but also international, takes part in the revival of the city, which is transforming itself, becoming an industrial place again, once again, becoming a place with many um, economical activities, becoming a place with artistic and touristic activities. 
Well, that's all for this short presentation, so that to give you an idea of what we're doing, to show you a few slides. But of course, I, I would love to answer your questions. I think that would be the most interesting part. Please, if you have any question, don't hesitate. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gray. So um, now uh, the floor is open to all participants. If you would like to uh, raise any questions about the presentation, about the Church of San Giuseppe, about um, yes, any issue that you think might be interesting to learn more about, feel free. You can raise your hand um, or you can just uh, speak directly. Um. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I'm first time in, uh, in this, uh, but not for the first time the member. And I'm from Serbia, from Belgrade. Hello, all from Belgrade. I work in cultural heritage institution. And uh, we have much experience about uh, many buildings, especially with churches and some old monuments, as, uh, as I said. So I just want to uh, congratulate for this magnificent work. And uh, yeah. I think the presentation is very well because uh, no more speak is necessary and everything is visible. Uh, it looks fantastic now. So just to ask uh, one question, if uh, they had any problem with workers and about experience and uh, uh, how the work was organized. Just that. Uh, how the work was organized, you mean? Yes. Well, first of all, we had to raise money, which is um, always a problem. So um, we did it in, in three ways. First of all, the, the church the, um, is owned by the city of Roubaix. So the city uh, put, um, I would say, two thirds of the money. Uh, it's a budget of uh, nearly 8 million euros. Um, then the French state gave us part of the money. And the rest was um, raised by uh, sponsors, donors. So we had a little group of 40 donors, and we still have them, by the way, so they're helping us for the rest. So that's, that way, um, we managed to raise the, the 8 millions we needed. After that, um, as the church is owned by the municipality, we had an architect in the town hall who organized the whole um, the room restoration process, with coordinating it with an architect, uh, um, which whom we employ for that. So the two, the two of them organized the restoration. And it involved many, many, many different uh, craftsmen. Um, uh, that means we restored the roof, we restored the, uh, the walls, we restored the uh, paintings, of course, which was the main item, which lasted years and years and years. We restored the stained glasses. As I told you, we also restored the bells. If each time it was a different uh, firm, but everything was coordinated by the, the city architect and another architect whom we employed. Thank you. I just want to add some uh, one thing may, probably most of you don't know, then uh, in Serbia, French School of Conservation and Restoration founded uh, everything uh, that uh, uh, actually, it was a big influence on the beginning of ah. one century ago. And all the books were, uh, in French and in Serbian. So, <laughs> oh, well, hundred years ago, that everything was in French. So, uh, I, I appreciate uh, that school very much, and uh, it uh, had a big influence in Serbia and still, oh. really. So, uh, once again, uh, congratulate. Uh, Thank you. Looks very, very, very nice. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Um, thank you very much. I missed the very beginning of your presentation. I apologize, but the part I saw was brilliant. Um, how important was it when you were doing this project that the local community was involved in seeing the church restored and being able to come back and use it again? Was that quite an important part of what you did? 
Um, yes, actually, it's a, par it's a paradox because um, the Hu neighborhood has become mostly uh, populated with Muslim inhabitants, but still there is um, a Catholic community, about 200 persons, as I said. Uh, um, actually, there are those who started the renovation process. Because you see, a long time ago in France, I don't know about Britain, but in France, neo-Gothic was not a very popular kind of um, aesthetic. So nobody was really very much caring about that church or others of the same uh, style. Um, it was preserved, but that was all. The minimum was done so that the, the church could still function. And really, these were the local inhabitants living next door who said, but look, we, we, we have a fantastic church here. What you people from the town hall are doing about it, please help us. So they moved the whole thing from the very beginning. And uh, so they started, um, you see, it started with a few people and then they started to raise attention in the whole city, um, have a local association um, started and they, they really drew the attention of the, of the municipality on the beauty of the church. And that's how it started. And these people are still there, you see. I can't go to sleep every night, they call me, no, I'm joking, but uh, very, very often they call me and say, well, look, what's, what's going on? We were supposed to do the organ, where are you? When do you start? So they are those who started it and they're still there, still looking after it. And we really work in a good, um, in a good spirit because I think it's very important that they be there and that they, they put pressure, kind pressure. It's a very kind pressure, mild pressure, don't worry. There's no hostility. We all work together in, as a team, but still I would say that the, the main people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because we in, I work in England and we have a church in Bolton, which is a town oh, in the north of I England. Know. Yes, well, I've you all know about there. it. Yeah, well, it's a similar thing where the community is is largely Muslim, um, but they wanted the church building to still be beautiful. And, and you're right about neo-Gothic. We also neglected our neo-Gothic buildings. And now people are spending quite a lot of effort to try and look after them better. But the, um, the case in Bolton has worked really well. And exactly the same, as you say, there's this small group of people in that area who keep the pressure up. They keep reminding everyone that actually this is a place worth looking after so it's just joyful to see what you've been able to achieve there it's absolutely brilliant thank you well thank you and Bolton is great too I've been there it's a fantastic place really we great can, we can twin them yes why not why not do you have other questions I can ask another one. No yes, one else. I mean, I, I, I've always been interested. And I, so I always get asked when I, because I work for the Church of England. And in England, the Church of England is part of the state, but it doesn't have a an ownership responsibility with the state. So the church buildings aren't owned by the government in the way that they are in France. Yes. So people always say to me, we should move to the French model and then we'll have funding to be able to fix our churches. And I say to them, I don't think that's quite how it works. But actually, I'd be interested in your reflections of how the state owning the church buildings impacts on the ability to maintain that heritage, whether it's a model you think is, is a good one. Well, I mean, I think it's a model which works, actually. But I mean, other models work, too. It depends on the, on the countries. Uh, actually, all the churches between uh, 1905 are owned by the French state, most of them. And they are all not exactly owned directly. Um, they are given to the cities where they, they are to be found. So that in Roubaix, for instance, in the town of Roubaix, the owner is the uh, municipality. It's not the French state, really. So, of course, because we are the owners, it has got lots of advantages and also lots of drawbacks. Uh, the drawback is that, for instance, in a, in a city which was immensely rich 100 years ago and which is not so rich nowadays, um, it's a heavy pressure to have so many churches um, which we have to look after. So that's, that's a drawback. But the advantage is that, of course, we are the owners. There's a lot of pressure from the population to, to ask us to maintain them. And so every time we have a church, we put some money in it. 
And I, I would say it's even more important for churches which are not as beautiful as Saint Joseph, because we have some which are a bit, well, they're all right, but nothing exceptional. And so you can't find really donors for these kind of churches. So then the municipality pays everything because sometimes they are not listed. And the French state pays only when they are listed. When they are listed, they can pay up to 40% of the, of the cost, up to. For Roubaix, they pay far less, but they can pay up to 40%. So really when we, our system means that a church which is owned by a municipality, the restoration is sometimes 100% at the cost of the municipality. One is um, um, a very important one from an aesthetical point of view or historical point of view, then uh, the French state will help. And of course, then we'll find donors. That's what we've done. And, and the church, uh, the Catholic church pays nothing really. Um, it's a bit unfair what I'm saying because for Saint Joseph, for instance, they've paid, they've, um, they've paid for the altar but that's a religious item. They really paid for it because it is uh, meant to serve um, religious purposes. They have not paid for the, I don't know, um, for, for the painting around the walls. So it's a very different system. And I think we're very different people. None is better than the other, but um, in France, the part of the state, the part of the um, municipal authorities is really, really very important. We're always expecting a lot from them. Mm -hmm. So it's really a different system. Uh, it's really interesting, though, and it does seem to have advantages in giving that real local ownership, which I think is important. How does it work elsewhere? Anybody else on the call that know how it works in there? How does it work in Serbia? Who pays for the churches there? Hello. Hello. Well, Serbia, uh, we have funding. Uh, I work in e institution and this is the city government in Belgrade. So we get, we got funding from city and from Ministry of Culture mostly, but uh, for many actions, especially in church, uh, the, it is most important uh, uh, good collaboration with church uh people and communities that you uh are involved but uh, it is maybe very easy here because all money uh, people want to give they give to church and the church is then participating in that so uh it uh, it depends uh, what uh, kind of uh, Church, so uh, what, uh, uh, how much it is old, and uh, if it is uh, interesting in that heritage way, uh, mm -hmm. it may be. Sometimes uh, we even have uh, only archaeological sites, but we know that some churches or monasteries were there. But maybe I think it is very good here that people. Uh, very uh, 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 they have faith <laughs> and they want to go to churches and the uh, churches are only churches nothing else so uh, i can say uh, we uh, um, i i worked in whole serbia in, uh, many many uh, places uh, uh, on balkan too but uh, i can say it mostly for belgrade we have under protection about 100 churches and monasteries. And we had an exhibition uh, two or three years ago because we are Belgrade and it is capital. So uh, many most important uh, church organizations are also in Belgrade, like uh, the municipality of church in, in Belgrade uh, and the other in is in Kosovo, so it is, you know, uh, two different places, but uh, most uh, all the monas monasteries are in Serbia. And uh, we have uh, some very interesting uh, uh, buildings, uh, some of only wooden churches, you know, that is village. Uh, village heritage is very, very 
uh, specific and uh, it is really uh, a big example of community <laughs> engaged in uh, that life because uh, almost every village has its church, almost, almost. Some, some churches for, for two or for three villages, but they know their priests and they communicate good and uh, their collaboration is the most important. Uh, but uh, I think that we are very lucky and uh, I hope you will understand me in the in right way that all churches are only churches and that uh, nobody wants to give them some uh, uh, second, uh, they are not the bandits. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, if uh, they are ruined, they are ruined because of wars many years ago, not, not this uh, 10 or three, uh, I mean about Second World War and that period of communism and everything, but uh, maybe you you saw that uh, two years ago, I think, or yeah, uh, it was finished that biggest church in Serbia, now it is in Belgrade, then Sava, I think it is the biggest also Orthodox church in in uh, Balkan, yes, and uh, I think that they have a, a big uh, about organization. They have a big uh, uh, responsibility and uh, involvement, but uh, a good cooperation with church is primary. And uh, uh, I think that in Belgrade, I can say that we don't have some problems now. Uh, Many problems existed, I say, when it was communism. And uh, for example, that church, San Sava, uh, began to build uh, about 30 uh, years of 20th century. And uh, it was uh, starting to, to uh, continue building uh, on the end of 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the new church, and probably uh, it will be. Uh, protected because of its uh, huge importance and very good, uh, everything in mosaic is there. But uh, I, I, I want to say that we have uh, different types and different uh, importance of those churches from that wooden to that the biggest one and uh, or Serbian Orthodox Church. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> many people don't know that uh, in Orthodox, uh, Orthodox churches are uh, everyone for each other, <laughs> not, uh, uh, so we have our uh, main patriarch, yeah, and uh, uh, only one that is uh, uh, bigger than him is uh, Vasteneni, because uh, they we got our autonomy from that. So uh, everyone is equal. <laughs> but we have also many synagogues, not many, few, because uh, unfortunately in our, uh, our Jews uh, mostly died in Second World War, and some of them uh, got away. And a couple of uh, Catholic churches then, um, some evangelic churches, but uh, those are small communities, and uh, uh, it looked uh, we have really, really uh, uh, it, it is church between two wars, uh, two war, yes, uh, first and second world war, um, big Catholic church in uh, one day of Belgrade. It is. Uh, a little bit modern, but mm. one of three in Belgrade, yeah. It's a very, very different system again. Yeah, yes, thank you. But, um, Sorry, Jenny, I cut across you. Yeah. That's okay. right. I mean, I was, go I was going to ask something totally yes. different. I just wondered um, how you got hold of your craftspeople for restoring the church. Uh, and uh, I mean, I know you had, did you say you had two architects? The yes. municipal architect and and another one. Yes. And I wondered if you if there were 
German artisans in Roubaix itself who could res do res restoration of the church. Okay. Um, so actually, I said we had we had two architects. That's true, but there was one main one was um, um, in charge of the whole uh, project, and the architect from this from the municipality was just checking what was being oh, done. Okay. So one architect was in charge; he was employed for that, and uh, um, but the other one was just uh, our local representative, so to speak, the representative of the owner. Um, how did we get the artisans? No, they were not from Roubaix. First of all, it is a listed church, so we can't do whatever we want uh, in France. Um, when it is listed, we have only the possibility to have to employ craftsmen um, who have certain qualifications. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we have to, we, it's a, we, we can't choose. I mean, we can't choose from the start. We have to advertise. We advertise, we receive the offers, and then we make a selection with the jury. So that's how it works. So that, um, of course, uh, there is no irregularity. Everything is checked. Everything is properly um, uh, advertised. And, and uh, so that we could very well have someone from the other side of, um, of France. Actually, our craftsmen, I can tell you, some of them came from nearby. Um, there was one craftsman, um, the one who was in charge of the stained glass windows, came from 10 kilometers away, but mm -hmm. others came from the Paris region. Uh, mostly they came from the Paris region, and the one from the roof too came about, from, was about 10 kilometers away. They always have an advantage when they come from nearby, because they don't have to pay for hotels for their, um, for, for their workers. Mm -hmm. So, of course, normally they are a bit cheaper. But, for instance, the person who restored uh, the, whole, um, the whole of the painting was coming from the south of Paris. So, everything is very regulated, especially for a listed building, as I told you. We, we can't choose anybody and we have to advertise and we have to have a jury. And roughly, to tell you the truth, it works more or less well, more or less, um, the electrician ran bankrupt in uh, in the course of the process, um, not by unpaid, unpaid bills from the city of Roubaix. We always paid on time, but he ran bankrupt anyway. So we had to change the number of electrician. And uh, we also had a major problem with someone who was doing the painting, the one who had the, whom we had employed at first. The quality was not there, and we just terminated the contract as soon as we realized that it was not the quality we wanted. Mm -hmm. And so we re-advertised and we got somebody else. And uh, that's how we, we managed to do the whole thing. It was a large process because we started advertising more than one year before. And as I told you, it lasted seven years, the whole restoration. And, and were you, um, were you um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> Were you involving any young people from from the community who who might be interested in becoming um, artists and uh, craft yes. people? Exactly, that's what we did. We obliged um, every uh, company, every company who was working, every uh, was working for us to employ young people. The problem is that legally we cannot oblige them to take them someone from the local community. They can take young people from everywhere they want, but it, we can't force them to take someone from the local community. So actually all of them had young people working with them. And it so happened that one was really living next door to the church and uh, he did a good job and he qualified as a, 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 a craftsman for stained glasses. After um, these years, he became a, a stained glass uh, craftsmen, but they were not all from local community. It was our idea at the beginning because that would have involved the people living next door, mm -hmm. but it's not legal. We can't say we want them just from there. Okay. So. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do you have other questions? Um, yeah, I see Lillian has her hand up. I see. Oh, oh, yes, Lillian. <laughs> Bonjour, Lilian. Nice to see you. It's good to see you again and to listen to this wonderful 
restoration that you finally finished. Uh, uh, Not quite, but nearly, Lilian, nearly. I you can remember I visited you at, I think it's almost six years ago or... Uh, seven six, years, Lilian. Seven six. years. In, um, I, I was just wondering, as, uh, Beck, as um, Jenny asked for young people, in the Netherlands, according to law, as soon as you receive restoration budgets from the government, you are obliged to, um, uh, not from your uh, uh, place but uh, or your village, but at least you are obliged, all the people working on the building are obliged to have uh, young craftsmen or to guide, uh, or new, uh, guide new people into craftsmanship. Is this, also, uh, is this also according to French law or not? It is not, as far as I know, but we did it in Roubaix because we wanted to have it. So we obliged all persons who advertise. It wasn't a contract. They could advertise only. Uh, they could um, uh, they could um, um, try and, and get the contract only if they promised to take young people. That was the condition. And um, but no, there is no law um, ob um, obliging us to do that in France right now. Most do, by the way. But not all, especially small companies. Sometimes for them, it's a bit difficult. And um, also there was a special problem with those restoring the roof because to, to climb on a roof, you have to have certain habilitations. And normally you can't take youngsters who have absolutely no qualifications. So it was a bit more difficult with these so that they could only work in the, in the workshop, not on the roof itself. But anyway, we managed. and. Um, Yes, to get back to your question, it's not compulsory in France, but we made it compulsory in Roubaix because we felt it was so important. Interesting. Um, Do you have any other questions? Not for me. Maybe I can go ahead? Yes. Uh, because I'm curious about the, um, uh, your plans to promote the, the church as a cultural space and your plans to attract more visitors. Uh, so right before we started, we exchanged a few words and you mentioned that you are hosting concerts and yes. that you have some other plans such as uh, film screening and live organ music. Yes. So I wanted to hear about your, your plans to... Yes. Well, um, we have several kind of plan plans, but first of all, we, before reopening, we were a little worried, I must say. We knew that the community was 200 persons. Um, so that it means that roughly when you go to mass, there's about 50 persons at the same time, because not the 200 believers rush every day to the church. So of course, the religious activities are the most important. One, this is a consecrated um, church, it's still functioning and we have to respect that. By the way, we have to respect it by law, the nine, uh, 905, uh, the law from 900, uh, 1905 has to be respected. So there's no question about that, but still uh, we discussed with the priest because of course we knew that the church was going to be occupied only on Wednesday afternoons with uh, um, pupils only on Saturday afternoons with masses and, and with um, baptisms when weddings and only on Sunday mornings with mass masses. So it was a bit of a concern because we invested, it's not all about money, but still if you invest 8 million euros in a church which is going to work one or two days a week, it's a bit of a problem. So we didn't put it that way to the, to the priest and was, by the way, quite open and quite aware of this uh, reality. But we went to see him and we, we discussed with him the possibility to have other kind of activities. And as a matter of fact, I would say that we are having two kind of activities. The first one is touristic, a touristic one. We're trying to develop Roubaix as a touristic place. It sounds, those who know the place, it sounds amazing. It was an industrial place. Uh, 100 years ago, there was smoke, there were workers everywhere. Um, there were, I mean, a lot of uh, activity, but nothing to do with tourists, really. So this was a major challenge to transform the city in a touristic place. And I showed you um, a photo, for instance, of our, in, of our museum. And right now, we're trying to organize tours to make people become aware of the beauty of our heritage and to bring people, for instance, to the church. So now we have groups every week coming to the church. 
every week. I would nearly say every day, uh, from Tuesday to Saturday, there's groups every day. So that's, that's a good thing, but this is not enough. Um, what we wanted is to also have, um, um, because those people were coming, they are local, but they're also tourists, but we also wanted to have a life um, activities dedicated to the locals. So we, we felt with the priest that the most interesting activity was the, cons the concerts. Why? Well, first of all, there's a fantastic acoustic. The, the, the nave is in wood, so it works very well indeed. There's an organ. We, we, we just raised the money to get it um, restored, so I just have the money in the bank. I'm ready. We are ready to do it. And so we have, um, we, we have a beautiful organ, we have a wonderful acoustic, and um, we felt that we could organize concerts. So we worked on that with the priests who accepted, and, um, and for the time being, there are concerts organized by volunteers, but we want to also to have paying concerts organized by the local theater. So that's something we're working on because that would bring activities throughout the year and every week. So we're working on that. But for us, once again, it's very important that the church be occupied always, be it for religious activities, be it for touristic activities, be it for artistic activities. I see. Yes. yes. I see there's a hand raised, uh, ah, yes. Manuela Klauser. Manuela? Yes, hi. Um, I'm Manuela Klauser from Germany. Um, yes. I work as an editor for a, a church project, Straße der Moderne, which uh, mainly documents C20 churches in Germany. And uh, so um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I saw a, um, a documentation about the transformation in Roubaix, and I was very delighted about the whole process. And um, so I was looking forward to your talk today and uh, the mm -hmm. transformation of churches in Roubaix as well. Um, but um, uh, you, you said there are other churches in Rubei, and uh, when I when I saw this documentation, my first look was for C20 churches and uh, what kind of churches we have from the 20th century in Rubei. And um, well, um, as far as I understand, you know, you're focusing on uh, Saint Joseph uh, to make it as to a place to be um, in culture and um, in um, confession as well. But what do you think will happen to the other churches? Or what, what can, could one do about the other churches, with, which are also very interesting when, yes. one, when one is um, ready to talk about 20th century architecture? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, we have many other churches. Don't tell me I'm going to get a heart attack today. Uh, thinking of all we have to do apart from Saint Joseph, but I will answer you seriously. Yes, we have many others. So, what we're going to do about it? Um, first of all, some of them were destroyed. There was a time when, uh, when they were unoccupied, people were I mean, destroying them. So that that was a major concern. This is stopped now. Now there's no destructions of churches. They're all kept. Um, uh, so there's, first of all, there's different kind of churches. There's some are owned by the Roubaix municipalities. Some have been built after 1905. And that means they've been built by the church itself. And on these, we can't do anything by law. I mean, the municipality can't act. So unfortunately for most, for um, all of the 20th century uh, churches, which are in Roubaix, we can't do anything. Legally, this is not possible. So the, only the, um, the Catholic Church in Roubaix, uh, Catholic Church in France, is um, allowed to work on these projects. And so, of course, we are we are keeping an eye, but we are by law not allowed to take part in any way. So, as concerned the other churches, those we own, the French, um, uh, the the city of Roubaix. Well, there's um, many different cases. First of all, some of them are still um, working as uh, churches. I mean, we, they have their own um, believers, and some have a lot of believers, actually. Uh, so, but they still, um, there's, there's nothing to do for us right now apart from maintaining them. For the rest, um, it's a worry. 
because uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, little by little, we see that uh, religious communities are, um, are vanishing or are diminishing. So um, we've not worked on them right now, but um, because actually we have two projects right now, Saint Joseph and another church I'm going to tell you about. Uh, so we've not worked on it together but, uh, right now. But I think that for all these other churches where the, the, the believers are less important in numbers, maybe one day we'll have to start talking with the Catholic Church. And, but for the time being, this is not the question because this, they still have their small but active communities. And besides, as I told you, uh, we have Saint Joseph. It's not finished. We need money, I told you. We're looking forward to uh, restoring the organ. But still, we have another major project right now. We have an 1840, uh, 1848 uh, church, um, which is neoclassical, which is quite beautiful, which in its own time hosted 1,000 believers, um, not sitting, just um, standing. So it's a very, very, very large church. And right now, uh, this is our next target, so to speak. So right now we're working on it. We want to launch and, um, how do you say that in English? We want to advertise and see who could have a good project for that church. So our idea, to cut it short, is to, do, to work one church after the other. That means right now we have nearly finished one. We're going to work on that uh, Notre Dame church. Uh, and then, um, little by little, we'll see if other churches become empty. As for the churches owned by the Catholic Church itself, uh, some are, one is empty right now, but we can't do anything about it, unfortunately. And another one is having uh, religious activity which is rather limited but still working but I think it needs a lot of repair and, uh, and it's like in Saint Joseph a group of people have united and they're trying to raise funds right now so um, I hope I gave you a good idea some I can't do much about it because this is not legal and uh, some we're looking after them uh, we have one project coming very soon which is going to be a very large project and for the rest well, we keep an eye and see when they get empty, if they do, because if believers still come, but that's the main thing for us. That's great, because we don't have anything to do. There's a priest, believers will look after the church and there's nothing to be done. So our idea is working on our churches one after the other. Actually, Lilian knows I've been with us, with me to the other ch next church we're going to work on. Does that answer your question? Well, yes, thank you very much. Lilian, you wanted to... Yes, to I, can you hear me? I don't know. Yes. Okay. Yes, I, I just wanted... It's very interesting what you told uh, Manuela, and I know uh, the city of Roubaix is a very forward-thinking city, as it was a former industrialized city, as, as Guy already explained, and, and now there is a lot of buildings are empty. Uh, so I just wondered, as for the programming of the Saint Joseph, uh, um, do you, for instance, you mentioned you have now a lot of visitors, at least more than in the beginning, uh, more regularly. Um, and I just wondered, do you have a combi ticket with, for instance, the museum, the, um, well, I don't know, the Piscine? Yeah, mm -hmm. La Piscine. Is there a combination ticket like the churches, for instance, uh, as I saw in a, an example in Venice, that uh, the religious sites, they are uh, a part of the combination ticket to visit Venice. And in this way, they also gain more visitors and so on. Um, actually, we do tickets when there's um, a fee to be paid. So the church, it's free entry. So we, we don't have a combined ticket. We have a combined ticket between our museum and we have two museums in Roubaix. There's combined tickets. We have that uh, Villa Cavrois which is a beautiful modernist house next door. And we also have combined tickets, but we can't work on the combined tickets, at least uh, um, here in France, if it's free, because one is paying, the other one is free. And if the oh, entry okay. church is free, but, but uh, that is exactly what we're going to do is to try and connect the church more with the museum, because that is the museum 
is a museum dedicated to the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, and especially to the connection between Beaux Arts and applied art. And the, the uh, Saint Joseph Church is exactly um, is a very good example of, con of a connection between Beaux Arts and applied art. So there is an uh, obvious connection between the museum and the and the church. And the museum has got right now 300,000 visitors a year. It's a small museum, mind you. It's a municipal museum. It's not the Louvre or whatever. It's owned by the city too, the municipality. Still, it has got 300,000 visitors a year. So one of our targets is trying to bring a part of these visitors to the church. Yeah. We've not worked too much on it so far, because right now we're trying to get the teams of volunteers to get the church open a bit more. Because right now, it's got limited uh, opening times. So once we manage that, and we're working on that right now, once we manage that, we immediately advertise by the way of the, um, of the museum and try to connect the publics. The public, so that people come to Roubaix, they visit a museum, they visit a church. Uh, La Villa Cavois is not in Roubaix, it is in Croix, the city next door, but it doesn't matter. And they go and visit, um, they go and visit uh, La Villa Cavois, for instance. So we're trying to work in tours like this. Yeah, but in, uh, sorry, in Venice, it's a kind of solidarity program. Eh? So, uh, so, so maybe I don't know how much money will flow to the churches, and, and probably less than to the other sites. But at least it is advertised as part of the ticket, and it is in the in the route, and so on. Uh, and I and I also wondered. Um, you just explained to to Manuela because uh, uh, we are learning all from each other. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, for instance, you have now this project from the from the government called church visions per municipality. So in, in well, whatever, look at how many religious heritage you have in your, in your city, uh, depending on either you have the, you are the ownership or responsible or not. But in this way, you, you, uh, you put everything on the map, you learn how the status of the buildings is, uh, what the needs are, how many visit, uh, how many are still vital and how many might become abandoned within a few years or whatever. And in this way, uh, create a kind of a relationship also with owners, uh, uh, with the churches that are not uh, in the support of the municipality under the 1905 law, but then at least uh, uh, make them part of the vision of the city. And in this way, they can also be connected. Mm. You can also prevent that sometimes you have this similar program because if you have 20 of them, as uh, Manuela said in, in, in her, uh, uh, the ones that she's working with, and you do the programming not together, but uh, you do the same things at the same level and you target the same public, that might not be very wise. So in the Netherlands, they are now thinking first to sit together to create a synergy and to build a relationship also for the future because we have a strict separation of church and state. But maybe this is an idea, Guy, I, I just wanted to share, and it was the minister who, who gave the money because the minister said, even though we have a strict separation of church and state in the Netherlands, we are talking about our cultural heritage and it is becoming abandoned rapidly. So 1700 will be abandoned in my, in my uh, city, or at least in, in the Netherlands of the 7,000 that are still working. Um, but um, uh, this might be an opportunity or a chance, even though you are not obliged to, but also from the perspective of the city tourism uh, uh, idea, it might be, you know, you, you can create another angle to sit at one table and to listen and uh, to each other. It's just, um, uh, uh, just an idea. And the other thing that I wanted to share with you, uh, uh, Guy, also is that if you only work with volunteers, as the municipality is so supportive of the religious heritage, also with the monastery I know about and so on, yes. um, in the Netherlands, the model works best if um, I'm also in a church board of one of these huge buildings, if you can probably employ somebody who organizes the events. And so maybe in connection with the museum or, or whatever, the more buildings you have, the more easy it is to pay somebody salary, you know, instead of only relying on the, on the priest or the volunteers. And it, and it seems to work well, 
And I was also talking in the Netherlands, you have also these huge churches uh, um, that are now starting to work together for the programming. You know, if you have a very well appreciated orchestra or you have a very well run exhibition, um, that you start sharing. And this could maybe even be an idea for FRH to do this on the European level, eh? to have this more, especially with, with huge buildings, or you have these travel exhibitions, which then uh, steer a lot of public to, to visit the buildings. It's just an idea, Guy, because we haven't spoken wow. so long. And mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted nice. to share. Yeah, yeah. Just want to. Just answer you and uh, give you a few answers. Uh, first of all, we're not working in the way you're saying. We've not gone that far. But right now, yes, we, we're very much in connection because I, I've spoken a lot from the municipal point of view, which is normal. I'm a civil servant myself. But what I want to tell you is that we work a lot with the church. There's no, we are um, hand in hand, so to speak. We're not in opposition. We're always working together. And actually, um, I'm very much interested in what they are doing in their own churches, so to speak. I mean, the one they own, they own themselves. And they are, of course, uh, in touch with us to know what we're doing in the churches we own. So, but still, we've not gone that far, as you say. But that's a great idea. But at least what I want to say is that we're really in, in keeping in touch. I would say every week I've got the priest on the line, more or less. And so. But just to give you an idea that we are very, very close. Um, so that's that's one thing. And um, there's one point which I've not uh, uh, told um, Manuela. And um, what you were saying reminded me of that point. Actually, right now, in Roubaix, and I, we, we're facing the transformation, the situation of the renovation or the transformation of the churches. Uh, this is something rather new for us. But we, we have a lot of experience in transforming buildings. You could see, for instance, La Piscine, which was a real swimming pool before and which became an art museum, a painting and sculpture museum. And I showed you a photograph. Actually, we, we've gone through phases in Roubaix. First phase was to transform the industries, uh, I mean, the factories, the, uh, transforming them in, in uh, apartments, in dance studios, in many different things. And that was not easy in that at that time, um, 20, 20 or so years ago. At that time, nobody wanted to live in a factory, for instance. And um, it was a bit strange to imagine a dance school in a, in a factory. So we managed to do this kind of transformation, and we got a lot of experience in that. Then, we, more or less at the same time, we managed to transform um, serv um, buildings which were dedicated to services. I mean, gymnasium, I mean, swimming pool. So you've seen an example. That was also not very easy because if you want to keep the beauty of the, of the heritage of a swimming pool and exhibit paintings there, I can tell you this is damn difficult because there's humidity, you have to deal with this problem. The, the, the should, there should not be any dampness anywhere. Uh, especially when we, we now we exhibit Picasso, Chagall, and so on, and it's very, very strict rules. So we managed to do that and we gained some skill. And now, maybe, uh, not maybe, but much later than other way, elsewhere in Europe, um, we're facing the problem of churches getting little by little empty. So that's where we are, and again, you know it, that's where we're starting to get experience. And I, I do thank the FRH, for instance, for sharing so much experience, because for us, it's very, very inspiring, actually. But Manuela, you had a question. Well, no, um, not really a question. I, I just, um, um, well, thank you to you and your comments. That's very helpful. And also to Lillian, because I think the, the, the point she's, uh, she was focusing on to see the, the re religious heritage as a, um, as a whole and not just see the, the, the listed churches, not just see the really old and very, very beautiful churches, but, but to, trying to, to talk about transformation of the whole religious heritage. That's really an important point for the future i think yes so very very Good. difficult <laughs> yes <laughs> that's a nice challenge too it's you. a nice challenge but but um for um in, in Germany, I can actually see the big problem that there are really a lot of good ideas a lot of concepts but 
uh, very often there is nobody who wants to take um, the responsibility for the for the um, churches itself. So there are people, there are communities who want to do projects, who want to work with them, sometimes culturally, sometimes socially. But um, when the church doesn't want them and the municipality doesn't want them, who is the owner of the church in the end? That's a big problem at the moment, I think. I understand. Any other question or maybe Jody? Yes, I see Lillian, you have a question, and then I, perhaps I, I, we'll need to uh, conclude the session, sadly. Okay, okay. Well, I just wanted to reflect on Manuela. It is, yes, who is the owner of the building? Well, I think, at least that's my opinion, uh, if we want to bring this religious heritage forward, you have to work together on all different levels. And as Guy said, they have an enormous experience because he's very modest. They have an enormous experience in, in reuse of buildings. And, uh, and uh, religious heritage, especially church buildings or, or other religions, from the morphology type of point of view, it is hard, but also from the emotional aspect view and, uh, and also from the religious side. So in the Netherlands before we, we a lot of buildings were demolished. A lot of buildings are also found reuse. But now we are facing again that we also do think that extended use, you know, keeping part religious because this is where they were intended to be used for. And also the architecture, especially with Catholic buildings is very much related to mass and to religion and so on. Um, uh, and then combine it with other use more for the municipalities. And if you try to do it like this way, it might work. At least that's what we are going to try now more and more often in order to also help the religious uh, um, organizations because they, they are, as he said, and everybody knows, they are getting smaller and smaller and they do not have the full amount of people anymore. Uh, 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 apart from the money, but also they do not have the expertise anymore because in the ages that they were building buildings, they all had these special departments from people who knew everything about church building, but they do not have special departments of people who know everything about how to do an extended use or how to find reuse and uh, because they of course they want to focus on their religion and their liturgy and and, and they are already less people so I think the society needs to step in but this is a step forward and that's why I ask Guy also they are speaking with them and they are on speaking terms which is already very good because then at least you are close to each other and you are not and, and you can help maybe with per permits or other small things in order to bring things forward but if you ask who's the owner I think all of us uh, uh, should take a step forward because otherwise we won't make it. We have an enormous amount of religious heritage, of course. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. Great, if there's any last comment, um, maybe there's still a minute or two. Well, if not, um, I would like to thank participants for this very engaging discussion uh, you've had after the presentation. And of course, many thanks to uh, Gio Gay for this wonderful presentation on the Church of San Joseph. And we hope that uh, this was an interesting, uh, well, I, I, I see it was a very interesting presentation, actually, and everybody was very uh, welcome this presentation and, and it raised a lot of topics to keep in mind and a lot of issues to, to continue discussing and in future opportunities. So um, yes, yeah, so once again, many thanks to, to participants, to Juge for the presentation, and we look forward to welcoming you at the next uh, FRH talk. And thank you to Jordi and the FRH team for organizing the talk. It was really nice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, well, Bye. have a very nice day. Goodbye. Bye.